action. Good afternoon, good day, wherever you are in the world, you are tuning in to another exciting show of Senior Talk with Claire Hubbard, your resource and information show for people getting better with age. I am very, very excited. We have a full show that is going to be very impactful for you today. Let me say, I have a doctor with us today. She is Dr. Jada Jackson. She is phenomenal. She is a woman who is of influence across the country. She's been on runways. She's been behind the podium. She has been, um, she's almost like an American Express for the best in life. Let me tell you, she is Dr. <laughs> Jada Jackson. She is joining us today because let me tell you, um, we are doing this show because we know the impact of mental health on our community. We don't take the time to address the importance of us being involved in mental health, us also working to have our families be comfortable with the conversation. A lot of us choose to self-diagnose. And so that is not a good option for us at all times. So I brought a doctor on, a good friend of mine. We had the pleasure of meeting each other um, year back, almost a little bit, a, a year ago in some time um, at the beautiful Stella Awards that we dearly missed this year. However, um, we, we vibed and we met and we just had a great energy. And I thought that she would be a great expert to talk about mental health. She is a licensed mental health counselor. And that has a title in itself that she is also an influence of young women. She has worked on many platforms and we'll let her tell her story. So before we go any further, thank you and welcome Dr. Jada. How are you this beautiful day? I am so great and it is amazing. You give the best introductions. I'm gonna take you with me and have you introduce me everywhere I go. How about that? <laughs> my pleasure, my pleasure. I am ready. <laughs> I am wonderful. So would you please um, give us a little of history about you and then what brought you to this phenomenal work that you're doing now? Absolutely. You um, hit the nail on the head. I'm a licensed mental health counselor and I'm licensed in the state of Florida as a mental health counselor and then licensed in the state of Texas as a licensed professional counselor. And I'm also licensed nationally as a national certified counselor. So that's all of that's very important because you want to, when you're looking for a mental health professional, you wanna make sure that that professional is certified, is licensed and that person has the experience to diagnose complicated uh, mental health disorders. So um, the thing that brought me to this is I, um, you mentioned it, I traveled with Ebony Fashion Fair for 10 years. So I was um, one of the faces of Fashion Fair Cosmetics, a spokesmodel and um, traveled the world and had, was just exposed to so much culture and um, so many different opportunities. But one of the things that I noticed is um, a lot of the models and the young women that I met and the ones that I worked with, they did not have that um, that self-confidence. They did not have the uh, self-esteem that was equivalent to the way they looked on the outside. And I just said, there's a, a incongruence here. Something's wrong with this. Like, what is going on? Mm -hmm. So um, I did a lot of mentoring and um, God called me at an early age, um, around 19, I just knew that it was my um, calling to help others, to become an educator, um, and to use that platform to bring people to a place of understanding, not only mental health, but you know, emotional management, understanding life in general, because life is complicated. Now you touched something I wanted to know and we do have some questions we're gonna dive into. I think you're speaking to me. What is emotional management? I think everyone can take a, mm -hmm. please give me a definition of what emotional management is. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, here's the thing. We all know what our emotions are because we feel mm -hmm. them. We know when we get 
angry, that our blood starts to warm and, you know, you get that sensation that rushes from the top of your head down to your toes and then you can't control it. Right. And then right. We, we understand our emotions as it relates to um, that moment when you're embarrassed, when somebody says something that's just a little off. You know, so we understand that we have emotions. One of the things that we haven't been taught and I have been pushing for um, schools to implement some form of emotional intelligence or emotional management skill set at an earlier age, because that is something we were not taught. So um, yeah. when I'm working with my clients, I want them to be able to define and acknowledge what they are feeling so that they can address the real issues and they do not become emotionally hijacked. And one of the things that I say all the time is if I come in contact with someone who cannot control their own emotions, they have the potential mm -hmm. to hijack my emotions and um, we can't have that. So <laughs> it's being able to recognize yeah. that we have the power to manage our emotions and biblically speaking, God gives us the power to do that. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I, I think that is so important because just, and we won't dive into some things that have happened more recently in our news, but if we had a control over our emotions, maybe some of our communities would not have been damaged. Yeah. We would have thought about how to maybe heal better, you know, and to be more impactful to what had happened. And that's another show, uh, maybe next it, month. It really no. is, it really <laughs> is, because I can jump right in the deep waters of that because you are at, you're, right. you just hit the nail on the head. Yes, absolutely. So we're here today. We're talking about mental health and aging. We know Senior Talk with Claire Hubbard. We've been doing our program for nine years plus, and we are advocating for seniors and veterans, but our seniors are called people getting better with age. They just, it's a softer term. They say, I don't want to be called a senior. We got you. So you're <laughs> getting better with age. So I'm excited about that. So what we're talking today is, um, I really brought Dr. Jada because I, I went through her bio and I've seen some of her work and I just think we need to just take a pause right now and talk about um, why are seniors or people getting better with age? Why do we refrain from mental uh, reporting mental health or how do we even recognize that we are at this stage because we just some of us just going on daily lives. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So how do we address the fact that there may be a mental health issue? Let's say it, through our loved ones and maybe we see a, a pattern change or what are your thoughts on that? Um, absolutely. Um, believe it or not, um, uh, people getting better with age usually will not necessarily report mental health issues. For one, mental um, health challenges are ambiguous. We, we, you can't reach mm -hmm. out and touch them. So just in our culture in general, we have this very interesting discrepancy between medical health, physical health, and mental health. They're both equally as important. Um, however, one major issue in diagnosing and treating um, people getting better with age is that they will report the physical symptoms, the physical ailments, the things that they can um, pre pretty much touch as opposed mm -hmm. to something that you can't quite grasp a hold of. So um, the focus is mostly on the physical. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, and I've learned this um, having just recently connected with some friends and worked on, you know, yoga and just even having devotion in the morning that your mind affects the body. Mm -hmm. It works. It, it works together. Mm -hmm. And so we don't tie the two. So I have to set my mind. And I remember now that we can go to church when you can go to church and they would say and close in my right mind. 
<laughs> we know what that means now. You know, that term years ago. I know what the seniors and the elders were saying. You know, I am closed in my right mind. But now we're talking about the mental state. The mm -hmm. mental state of how you open up to the day is a big part of your body and what happens. But then let's say I'm a caregiver, for instance. There are several thousands across the world, and we commend, we extend mm -hmm. our love and hearts around those who are serving, i.e. hospitals, i.e. nursing homes, i.e. rehabilitation centers, i.e. our service providers, our first responders. We just want to send a love and hug to you because they now have become, quote unquote, unofficial counselors. They're dealing with mental health situations. So what are the, some of the triggers um, that associated with aging because a lot of, of aging Americans and people getting better with age are still living independently on their own. So what are those triggers that maybe I would come in and visit grandma or granddad mm -hmm. and say, you know, something maybe needs to be addressed at this time. Um, great, great question. Here is another issue. When we think about aging, the first thing oftentimes we think about is someone in their body showing signs of weakness or signs of pain. And it's very physical, it's visual. And one mm -hmm. of the most common triggers for mental illness associated with aging is chronic pain. Now, I want to make sure that I um, uh, really kind of tease this out a little bit because I want to first acknowledge that pain is real. So that's a, mm -hmm. I, I wanna, that's a disclosure before I say what I'm getting ready to say, because the first response may be, no, wait a second, I really am in pain. But um, oftentimes mental illness can trigger certain types of symptoms and we call those somatic symptoms and somatic symptoms mm -hmm. can show up in the body as pain. So when we're looking at whether a person is legitimately in pain because there is a diagnosable medical issue, that's one thing. But then there's also mm -hmm. the pain that comes from um, mental illness. So it's being able to delineate between the two. So if you have someone who is um, getting better with age and they are struggling a little bit with physical symptoms, you want to rule out that it's not a medical issue first and then backtrack and make sure that you address the mental health component of that. And then there's also, um, of course, chronic disease. Um, the physical disabilities, um, whether you know it or not, loneliness for many of people in this category is very, very intense when it comes to um, slipping into depression or having those maybe panic attacks or paranoia when it comes to are they safe or um, you know, moments of not wanting to be alone because they're left with just their minds and their thoughts. And you remember, you know, there's more life behind us oftentimes at this period mm -hmm. of time than there is in front of us. So most often um, the thoughts will um, move backwards. And sometimes that's not a great thing if you're not um, happy with some of the lifestyles or some of the outcomes of life. Wow. Mm. I know the loneliness is something that we tackle often on our show. And I can actually say through my programming, I am very glad and honored that, as you mentioned, God would give me this assignment to be an advocate for seniors and people getting better with age. Yeah. Because one of the key factors, and I tell people, we believe that socialization is a better quality of life. So we miss going to the theaters. We take seniors to the movie theaters. Honestly, we can have three to four or 500 
people at a theater at 8 a.m. in the morning or 9 o'clock. <laughs> Our socialization, we have the line dancing, we have the social club checking in. I miss, and so those those things are active that keeps the bar, the brain moving. Um, we yeah. also do a big part called Midday Music Memories where we bring up old school music and they dance and have a great time. So I miss them too, <laughs> that socialization. And I'm, I'm almost into the loneliness, but I retract and come back again. And so now we're gonna do some things mobily just to say we love you and let them mm -hmm. know and see their faces. That loneliness is a huge, huge factor. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm glad people were in the, um, we have our, um, COVID team that is going to be going out and doing mobile, um, just hello music, some gift bags, information, stay in tune. We're here for you. We love you. You know, we just got to put a, put a, put some love back in the world and see them because they want to see us. And I thank God they even checked on me. So that's a beautiful thing because they missed the activity, but we have to do what we must do because COVID is real. Let's be very clear. Mm -hmm. And now how can we, um, what are the barriers to treatment? Or let me, let me start over. What is the resistance? Okay, I know there's something going on. Mm -hmm. I don't even want to deal with it. You know how we, we are resistant to getting treatment. So what are those barriers that we can overcome? Because it's a big help to have counseling and for specifically for um, African-Americans to be comfortable. Counseling mm -hmm. is not, oh, you're going, you're going down. It's a, it's a treatment that is mm -hmm. very helpful. So how do comfortable with counseling, if you would, Doc. Absolutely. Um, well, first, let me start with the um, the stigma of, of counseling and mental health. You know, we have gotten to a place where mental illness is, it only equates to crazy. And that's not true. And so much right. so, we do not even say that word because it's imperative to normalize the idea that when a person goes through regular, normal life phase of phase of life issues, and we've all we all go through those transitions, that change forces us into a space of being somewhat off kilter. And there's nothing wrong with that. What we have diagnosed as an issue, especially in our black community is, and I say diagnosed specifically because we become our own doctors and our own um, prescribers of what needs to be done. And the our um, African-American community pretty much says that if you go and ask for help, then there is some form of weakness or you're not trusting in the Lord or you're not um, praying enough or you're not, you know, doing the things that you're supposed to be doing. So there is this kind of backlash that comes with uh, mental health um, counseling. Now, I, I grew up in the church. I want to say that. And there is nothing that I believe more than waking up and being connected to the one who gave me life. At the same time, if you read his word, he tells us that to think on those things that are lovely, think on those things that are just, think on those things that are of good report. He tells us that we, we need to renew our minds. All of these things are so important. So to reject that, I believe puts us at a disadvantage in not addressing the real issues that will give us a better quality of life. So I wanted to address the stigma first. On the, the other side of it, um, you know, this is insane. So just listen to the statistics here. Primary care physicians fail to diagnose depression 50% of the time. That is a very high number, Clara. So when we're talking about addressing the issues, oftentimes these issues are misdiagnosed and maybe the issue um, or the symptom is assigned to some form of physical ailment 
but it really isn't. It's more of a mental health issue. So if we can renew our minds and we can learn to manage our emotions, then we may not slip into some of these physical um, challenges that we have. So one of the most common, um, the common barriers to mental health treatment is the stigma. And then that it's misdiagnosed um, half of the time. Wow, that is alarming. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that really, and you, you said it is, okay, in our family settings, we just assume, well, she got it, well, I'm gonna get it. You know, everyone's treatment factor is not the same. And just mm -hmm. because she may have had or he may have had it does not mean you will get it. And we just sometimes take on other people's, as you mentioned, I'll take on that because she got it. So I know it's going to happen to me. We'll take on the energy of it. Correct. And then we'll put it into our bodies. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's, a, ooh, that's, mm -hmm. ooh, that's a good one. I like that one. Mm -hmm. So we have to also be mindful of, as you said, the emotional management, managing emotions around crowds of people and in that energy. How do mm -hmm. I not be affected by what is being you know, by the energy I'm in, you know, how do I not take mm -hmm. on that? You know, that's a big one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's talk about this. Why is support and engagement important through mental health? We have to be comfortable because you said it's not, some people think it's a life sentence. Oh, I'm just going to die of this. That is not true. Mm -hmm. This treatment factor is so critical, but the family being open, especially the conversations, I think, I've said this before. I think some families, when we have our reunions, not that we would talk about mental health, but we need to have conversations about life, mm -hmm. you know, because we're not addressing those. We will see, oh, i.e., uh, uncle, whoever. Oh, he's just crazy. he been that way. Why do we have to presume that all the time? Mm -hmm. That is really interesting. Mm -hmm. But why is the support and engagement critical to a family setting to join in and be a part of the treatment or the process with a family member that's diagnosed with mental health or mental, mental issues, rather? I'm sorry. Sure. Um, you, well, first of all, remember connectivity and love and feel, feeling valued, um, feeling that we are wanted is a basic human need. That is the way mm -hmm. God created us. That is why we have relationship with him. That is why he allows us to have relationship with each other. So connectivity is just some a need that we have. So again, when you were talking about, um, you know, taking, um, you know, everyone out to the movie theater or doing line dancing or doing, you know, whatever it is, we need that socialization and we need that socialization because it's part of who we are that allows us mm -hmm. to elevate to that place of thriving in life. And when we're looking at other people, especially our own family members, you know, um, I'll share this. This is just a little sidebar is when my grandmother started to become ill and uh, she had dementia. And it was very difficult for our family because my grandmother was spunky and feisty. And I mean, you couldn't say nothing to my grandmother without her having a quick witty comeback or, you know, she was just that grandmother. <laughs> so um, when she started to become ill, it was interesting because some of us saw it right away and others was like, oh, mm -hmm. no, no, she's fine. That's just grandma. She's fine. She's fine. She's just. And they, there were all of these excuses for why she was not, you know, 100 percent mentally. And so one mm -hmm. of the things that I think is important is for families to be very much aware that, number one, the decline and ailment of our family members is not a reflection of us. And the reason yeah. I say that is because we are the gatekeepers for mental wellness and mental health. Meaning, mm -hmm. again, when we look at some of the issues that take place in our society, whether it's a bombing or whether it's a mass shooting, um, people would say, well, did you see the signs? Did anybody see the signs? 
Right. Most of the time, and Clara, here's another one of those situations. The family protected the information because they saw the behavior of that person as a personal reflection of their family or themselves. So those are those skeletons that we push in a closet and we don't want anyone to know. So wow. I would first say, just recognize that it's so important for us to stay true to self. And um, sometimes <laughs> mental illness is passed down from generation to generation. What I ask my clients when they come in, I want to know what is your mental health history? I want to know genetically, does your mom have bipolar disorder? Does your, um, did your father have schizophrenia? I want to know those things because there is a genetic component to the diagnosing of mental health issues. At the same time, people develop mental health issues oftentimes due to trauma, due to um, you know, uh, traumatic events, but also due to life in general. So- Let me ask a quick question, doctor. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Nope, go ahead. So let me ask, because you're on something that's really important. I think, I think you're gonna tie it in real good. So I have seen in, I don't wanna self-diagnose, this is my community view, in some situations where let's say a couple has been married for 55, 56, 70 years. Mm -hmm. But after they lose that spouse, I even know in my family, mm -hmm. after my aunt lost my uncle for over 60 years, I mean, within months, she, mm -hmm. her, her mental capacity was just leaving her. Mm -hmm. And we were all in shock. I mean, school teacher, I mean, for X amount of years, but they were always together. So to have that pulled away from her, her mind went within months. And I mean, I don't know if we have enough time to talk about it, but that losing that loved one and keeping your mental state is enough in itself for anybody. <laughs> so I, but I'm thinking of older Americans, especially those who've been married. You've been seeing situations where you've seen a couple been married for 60 years or better and then She'll pass that more than even he's gone just because they're so tight. I don't know if there's a relationship with that, but I know speaking just if losing a loved one, the mental, uh, the emotional management in your mind that you have to hold on to, mm -hmm. to keep you being focused and knowing to renew yourself in love. You know, I'm, I don't even know where I went with that. I just, I, I just know where you're going. Even... I know. Hey, I okay. got it. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a real, a real um, issue and widowhood. And I didn't get a chance to mention it earlier, but that's another um, common factor for one developing mental health issues. And it, and it does tie in very significantly to loneliness. But when you have that connective bond with someone, it does become like a lifeline. And that lifeline yeah. continues to allow your heart to thrive and it continues to give you purpose and hope to live. That is physically mm -hmm. and spiritually. So when that person leaves, it is very important to stay connected to the one who is remaining. Um, you know, healthy older adults can continue to thrive and to grow and enjoy life. Um, a lot of people think that mental health issues are significant to aging, and it's not. There really isn't a correlation there. But if okay. we can engage, like what you're doing, Claire, what you are doing is phenomenal because what you're doing is you're giving hope and you're giving purpose. You know, so doing all of those extra um, activities can keep a person engaged in life. Oh my goodness! Yes. Well, I don't. I'm, I'm sick because our time is very cl close to ending. But let me say before we go any further, those who are tuning in to whatever your local station is, of course, you're watching this live now on Senior Talk with Claire Hubbard Facebook and YouTube. Um, whew, Dr. Jada Jackson .com is the website. Dr. Jada. Well, Jada Jackson .com, but she is Dr. Jada Jackson, a <laughs> licensed mental health counselor. There we go. So we have to come back and um, 
address the widowed because it, 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 it is happening mm -hmm. in our community. We need to be refreshed in knowing that there is help. There's healing in the land. There is healing in the land. And we have to definitely be comfortable with that. So, Dr. Jada, um, I would ask you for a five second, well, a 10 second closeout, if you would. But everyone, please remember jadajackson.com and we'll have her back on our program real soon. So, what we're going to do is this. I am out of time. I am crazy. I am Claire Hubbard, of course. So, let me say this. As we always say, in complete darkness, we are all the same. It is only our knowledge and wisdom that separate us. Don't let your eyes deceive you. I am Clara Hubbard, the granddaughter in the community. Always glad to serve you. Thank you to our special guest, Dr. Jada Jackson. Visit her at jadajackson.com. God bless you. Be good to each other. And we will see you next time for Senior Talk with Clara Hubbard.